Liba Rivka. Right? Liba Rivka. Okay. So I'm not going to, I realized this week that I, that, that I was putting, trying to put my faith in the, in the weather, AccuWeather forecast. And I'm leaving, because they've been so, they're so accurate to the hour, yeah? But the, the forecast for this week was not good. You see, it's a very important mitzvah. First mitzvah of the Torah is to sanctify the new moon. Why do you sanctify a new moon? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to say a blessing. We thank Hashem for creating the new moon, creating the whole world. And this is the first commandment the Jewish people had in Egypt. And it's a very important commandment. What could be so important about sanctifying the moon? Because that's how the calendar works. The new moon is the first day of the month. And it was the first day of the first month <clears throat> in Egypt. Hashem told the Jewish people, told Moish, told the Jewish people, now we have to sanctify the new moon. And this became a commandment for, age, for, for thousands of years until the temple was destroyed. In the, in the days of the temple, witnesses had to come and say, we saw the new moon. And they had to give accurate testimony. And the sages had to know a lot of astronomy to know exactly if they were telling the truth or they were, had been fooled by an, an, a, an image in the clouds or whatever it was. We, why did we have to know that? Because we our, the next commandment was after 10 days, start counting 10 days. After 10 days on the 10th day of the first month, which is the month of spring and Nisan in the spring, Nisan means miracles, month of miracles. It's a miracle. The world is being reborn in the spring, just like we are reborn every morning. So we have to put the two together and realize that our life is also a miracle. And that's a fundamental awareness we have to have as soon as we wake up in the morning. Okay, so then count 10 days. And on the, so we had to know when to start counting. We can't know when to start counting if we don't know when to make the new moon. So how is Moshe supposed to know when to make the new moon? Hashem had to show him. This is what the new moon is going to look like. The first word a baby learns how to say is zeh, which means this. Anybody here have Hebrew par speaking parents? Yeah. No. So then in your own language, there's something equivalent. When a baby wants something, he says, Z. this is what I want, this. Z means you point with your finger and you say, Z. this is what I want. Okay, so Hashem says, Z. this is what the moon looks like. That's what it says in the Torah. This is what moon looks like when we make the new moon. All right, now on the 10th day, what did they have to do on the 10th day? They had to take a lamb, like for lamb chops. Roasted on an open fire, barbecue, on the 14th. Slaughter it and eat this lamb. And the next day you're going out of Egypt. After 210 years of slavery, you're, we're going out. So it's, it's a, a, a monumental revolution, which we live through every day and every month of our life. Because this is the foundation how our people started. So it's very, very important mitzvah. And the word for making the new month means, sanctifying the new month means <clears throat> something, making something totally new, higher than nature. The word for a month is chodesh. Chodesh, chodesh also means chidush, something new, revolutionary. So this was a revolution in Egypt. Never happened before, never happened again. That a nation was born from within a nation, like a child is born from within its mother. That a nation came out of another nation. We had some in, in, here in America, we, there were slaves that had been brought here by slave traders. And then under Abraham Lincoln, they were emancipated, it became illegal to have slaves. But a nation wasn't born. Here in Egypt, this was a unique phenomenon. A nation, a whole nation of people went out of Egypt never to become slaves again. A nation, like, a nation was born from within a nation. 
And this happened on the 14th of Nisan when the Jewish people took the idol, the God that was worshiped in Egypt as a God, a deity in the spring when the, the astrological sign is the sign <clears throat> of the lamb. And they took the idol of the Egyptians and they slaughtered it. And they have lamb chops. And that's the first Passover. When the strength and the, the idol, uh, ideology, the idol worshiping ideology of Egypt was overthrown and the ideology of believing in one invisible God who's the creator of heavens and earth was revealed in the world on a national scale. Now we have a commandment to, to bless the new moon when it comes. That's the basis of the Jewish calendar. There's some people who are, have become Americanized quite not naturally. And even in Israel, they became Israelized. And they want to use the non-Jewish calendar. But when push comes to shove, they don't make Yom Kippur according to any other day than what it is on the Jewish calendar. And they don't make Rosh Hashanah on any other day except it's the first day of the seventh month. And they don't make Pesach on any other day except it's the 14th day of the first month. So we, we have to follow the Jewish calendar because the Jewish people are compared to the moon and we count by the moon. There's a lot of similarities and a lot to be learned from all this. What am I getting at? To sanctify the new moon, we have to do it when it's on the ascent, when it's getting bigger. But it has to be visible. Now, there's certain Jewish groups that say, no, three days, when the moon is three days old, that's enough. However, <clears throat> the law, though, as we follow it, and, and many, many, most groups do follow it, that the moon has to be at least one quarter of its cycle, which is seven days, right? When the moon is seven days old, you see a half a moon. When it's 14 days old, you see a full moon. So at Passover, you look at the sky on the eve of Passover, when you finish with your Seder and you walk home at three o'clock in the morning, you'll see the moon is a beautiful full moon. And similarly on Sukkot, Sukkot is the 14th day of the month, the seventh month, you have a beautiful full moon. <clears throat> so when the moon is after seven days, it's what we call a half a moon. And after the 14th day, the moon starts to decline. That's a declining moon. We don't bless the moon when it's declining, only when it's growing. So what do we have? We have a window of seven days. From the seventh day to the 14th day, we have to bless the new moon. And the seventh day this, this month was, was Sunday. That meant that Saturday night, it was a, a question. Could we bless the new moon on Saturday night or not? Many people did. There was a moon. It was like the bare minimum of a moon. I waited. That means I had seven more days left to bless the new moon. I looked at the weather the next day. I opened my AccuWeather forecast. And what did it tell me? That we're going to have overcast, cloudy days. Rainy Sunday was a rainy day. No moon on Sunday. Monday was also gray and overcast and rainy. No moon. And the weather forecast was every day this week, it's going to be rainy and cloudy and overcast. No moon till next week. Next week, there's no new moon anymore. It's an old moon. It's a moon on the decline. Josephine, welcome. Nat, welcome. Fernando, welcome. Leah, welcome. A lot of people on the Zoom. Sarah Milligan, welcome. Nice to see you all this morning. Let me mark you present. Anyway, <clears throat> so I was despondent because I thought I'm not going to be able to bless the new moon this month. And as long as I've been doing this, 
for 40 years, I never missed a month. I didn't want to miss this month. I was so happy yesterday morning when I went out of the house and it was cold and there was a strong wind blowing from the north. You know what that means? It means it's going to blow away the clouds. This, the, 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 blow away all the high, the low pressure area. And we got this beautiful, clear, beautiful day. And last night we were saying to everybody was out blessing the new moon. So I wish you everybody a good chaydesh. We say a good chaydesh. It should be a good new moon, new month for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I don't have, I'm not going to pay my, so much attention to the weather forecast as I did in the past. Okay. Malka Levana, if you're here and anywhere, good morning. Ariel, where are you? I don't see you. Hannah didn't come in yet. Sarah Abigail Milligan is on the Zoom. And who else? Leah Rappaport, is that right? Is that you, Leah Le Rappaport? Yeah, it's me, Rabbi. Hey, from Brazil, where the nuts come from. Nat <laughs> <laughs> Semenson, where is Nat? Where is Natalie? Semenson. I don't see her name on the list, but she's on the Zoom. Okay, Nat on the list. Is Nat for Natalie? Yes, it is from Natalie. I'm from Brazil as well. Oh, from Brazil. Yes. So we have two nuts from Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> and Fernanda Brinstein. <clears throat> is also a Leia from Brazil, right? Yes, morning, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Chaya, Menasha, we got you. And Sara Beznos, yes. And we have a new student today. Lima Rivka and Chava. Chanel, Gila, Gila from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. What's your last name, Gila? Brown. What? Brown. How do you spell that? B-R-A-L. B-R-A-L. Brown. Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome. Homework assignment. First thing on your way to class is to look up. When you were a little girl, did they teach you the Shema? In your Sunday school? No? Well, the Shema is made up of three letters. Hear, O Israel. This is the watchword of our faith. Hear, O Israel. Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. We don't believe in two gods. This is a new idea that Jewish people brought to the world, discovered by Abraham and his wife, Sarah. The first word of the Shema means hear. Hear, O Israel. Take it into your heart, not just hear it. Uh, I hear you, I hear you. No, I hear you with all my concentration and all my feelings. So the three letters of the Shema are Shin Mem Ayin. And I forget what that's called. An acrostic maybe. Shin, when the first letters mean something else. Shin Mem Ayan. And this stands for three worlds. Three words. The shin means, and this is the word shma, okay? <clears throat> it means hear or listen or take it to heart. So that stands for the word se'u. Se'u. Friend of mine likes to make lawyer jokes. So a lawyer friend of his had a baby girl. He called her Sue. <laughs> Mem, this is Hana. This is Anna became Hana. Hana, this is Gila from Los Angeles. <laughs> the Mem stands for the word Marom. <clears throat> Oh, give me a home where the antelope roam. That's a different song. Where the deer live on a play. 
never is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play never is heard a discouraging word. Okay, the mem stands for moral, means on high. And the skies are not cloudy all day. And the ion stands for ion. Ion is Hebrew word, you know what it means? Ion means your eye. It's connected with your brain. Your eye is the portal for your brain. All the, most of the information you take into your life is through your eye. So your eye is connected with wisdom. Chachma is wisdom. And the sages, where the leaders of the Jewish people are called the eyes of the congregation. So the word ayin, actually the letter is pronounced ayin, which means an eye. That's the name of the letter. equals an I. And it's the first letter of a word which means your eyes. A na yim. A nayan means your eyes. Your eyes. So when you're saying Shema, it's really a code. You're saying something much deeper. Well, it's not much deeper. It is an explanation of what you're saying. You're saying Shema, that's su moraim that means chem means yours. Einechem means your eyes. Lift up your eyes and look what's going on up there. Who made this? That's your first homework assignment. On the way to class every morning, Lift up your eyes and behold the wonder and the greatness of Hashem's creation. Okay? That's a review, but now you're got to get good. We have to catch you up. We're learning <clears throat> in Tanya chapter six. What page should we get up to? We got up to. The idea that every Jewish person, just like angels have the, are actually completely subservient to Hashem. They do whatever Hashem wants them to do. We never hear about an angel saying, I don't want to. Angels don't say that. Little children, when they say, when they do what their parents want, the parents say, oh, you're such an angel. The angels do what, they're, what Hashem wants. But people... <laughs> We have a challenge. The challenge is in the left side of our heart. It's called the wise guy in the left side of your heart. Who says, I'm busy now, Ta. Mommy, you asked me to do that yesterday. Ask my sister. You know, okay, that's from the, the challenge from the, from the left side of the heart, from the animal soul, from the human animal soul, the vital soul which gives us a challenge. So everybody, angels don't challenge Hashem. They do what Hashem wants. Jewish people have a Yetzirah, an, an evil inclination that does challenge what Hashem wants. Okay? I love yogurt. Around four o'clock in the afternoon, I could really use a yogurt to pick me up. Yeah, but you had chicken for lunch. So the, the wise guy says, so what? But the good guy on the right side of your heart says, milk and meat, we don't mix. You have to wait, right? So that's the kind of challenge we go through. But every Jewish person has the potential to be like an angel, to, be, to do exactly what Hashem wants of us in Torah and Mitzvahs. And that's a tremendous, tremendous, uh, I'll use the word again for the second time today, revolutionary idea that every single Jewish person, I mean, it's, you know, in other words, 
serving Hashem with all your heart and soul and all your might is not just for big rabbis. In fact, sometimes big rabbis don't do it at all. They have ulterior motives. And this was a, the Chiddush, again, another word we use today, like the word Chiddush, which is something new, a new, a new body of time, a new window of time is a, a Chiddush called the month. Chiddush is a new idea that the Baal Shem Tov brought to Judaism, which is that <clears throat> the sincere service of God with all your heart will often be found in simple, ordinary, unlearned people who are devoted to goodness and truth. And it's very, very precious in the eyes of God. And at the time that the Baal Shem Tov was teaching this, so the so-called establishment, the intellectual establishment in Jewish society felt very threatened. But that's what it's all about. So, and this is where it says it here in chapter six, that every Jewish person has the potential in his heart to be totally devoted to, the, to Hashem and not to give up this, his connection to Hashem, even if it means that the, giving up your life. Even if it means giving up your life. I just read a story yesterday, you know, in the 19th century, that's the 1800s in Russia, Tsar Nicholas was a very cruel, cruel, wicked Tsar. Anna, Hannah, thank God you didn't live in his time. You know what they used to do? His goal, his dream, was to convert Jewish children to Christianity. <clears throat> and he had a good plan. It was copied by the communists. Get a hold of the children when they're young, when they're six years old, and brainwash them early. So they don't, they grow up not knowing anything at all about being Jewish. And then they become like Goyim. And they had, he had people <clears throat> roaming around in the Jewish communities, and they would kidnap children early, at an early age and, and take them to special schools where they would teach them Christianity. And if they didn't want to accept Christianity, they would torture them, really torture them, <clears throat> and beat it out of them until they forgot who they were and forgot their families and forgot where they came from. And then they would be conscripted into the army when they could fight it, you know, when they're strong enough and they're teen, teens, 16, 17 years old. They went to the army for 25 years. By this time, they're 25 and 17, is 35, they're 42 years old. They have no connection with Judaism. They were called Cantonistim. Cant Cantonistim. This is a terrible, terrible decree, ripping children away from their families. <clears throat> And the Rebbeim tried whatever they could to save these children. I read a story yesterday about a boy who was with a group of boys and they were given an ultimate, ultimatum. <clears throat> he was, they set an example of him. What, what was it? It's, it was this, this method was used, <clears throat> I believe in the Vietnam War. And it was used uh, <clears throat> in the war in the Gulf War, in the Gulf War also they used it, that they tie a person down on a board and they put him underwater. So he's just about dead, drowned, and then they bring him up and he has to give information. And if he doesn't give information, they do it again. So he's more dead than alive. And they did this to this boy. Part of their daily routine in the, in the camp that they were in was to go for a swim. And since this boy <coughs> had refused to accept the truth of Christianity, so the uh, officer in charge came up to him. He says, oh, you're a good boy. And puts his, dunks him under the water till he's almost lifeless. And then he brings him up. 
I said, no, now you accept? No, and over and over and over again. And oh, the other officers learned to do this from him. What a good trick. And, and so fine, the boys couldn't take it. They couldn't take it. So they said, okay, <clears throat> either you're gonna convert or else. So a bunch of the boys said, okay, we'll do it. And they made a whole ceremony. They were gonna go, they were gonna go to the water this time, not get done to just be so-called supposedly baptized, <clears throat> to enter them into the Christian faith. And then they would go to church and they would uh, you know, give them some ceremony that they should become Christian. And the boys amongst themselves <clears throat> made up what they're gonna do. And even the czar came to witness this tremendous ceremony. And who do we have here? Chedva. Chedva is here. Who else just came in? Chava. Chava. Chava Krimko from Toronto, right? I'm not from Toronto. Your mother's from Toronto. Yeah. Okay. You have a, so you have a Toronto connection. So do I. Sort of. Sort of. I grew up there. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so they made up what they're going to do. So when they came, came the time and the church authorities were there, the big shots from the church, and the czar was there himself to see this tremendous triumph of his policy. And so 20 boys marched with discipline. Oh, it was beautiful to see the discipline with which they marched. They took off their clothes and they marched. Or maybe they didn't take off their clothes. I've seen pictures of the baptism ceremonies. They have their clothes on. And they, they marched into the water. And they didn't come up. They made up with, themselves, with each other. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And they didn't come up. It was an embarrassment to everybody. And when the czar saw what had happened, they were committing suicide. He said, fish them out, fish them out, fish them out. Many of them, the one that this story is about him, he was a good swimmer <coughs> and he survived. He couldn't drown, he was, he was a good swimmer. He couldn't drown himself. The other boys didn't know how to swim and they were swept away by the current and they drowned. Most of them drowned. And he was fished out. So he had to go through 25 years of torture in the Russian army, getting beaten up regularly because he was Jewish until finally he was released when he was in his 40s. The story about them. But why do I tell you this story? Because this shows what it says here. In the town, you hear people, little, little boys, what do they know about Judaism? They didn't do this because they were scholars. They didn't do this because they learned Talmud or they learned Hasidus. They didn't learn anything. They were snatched away from their families when they were little kids. They just knew that they were Jewish. Some of them remembered the Shema. But this is what the Rebbe says here. The Alter Rebbe says, every Jew has the capacity in his heart to give up his life for the sanctification of the name of God and not to give up his belief in the one God. Like on Purim, when Hum, Haman, the wicked Haman wanted everybody to bow down to him and around his neck he wore an image of his idol, the, the idol that he worshipped, that he believed in. And everybody had to bow down to him because he was a prime minister and the king had given him total power. And Mordechai refused to do it. He just tapped his foot. That's the whole story. I'll tell you the story another time. He refused to do it. And this Haman got so angry that Mordechai refused to bow down to him. And Mordechai was the leader of the Jewish people. I'm going to get, get, get rid of Mordechai and all his people with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the children sing a song when the little children in, 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 the, in the Chadorim or in Beis Rivka put on a play so there's a song, you know, Haman said to Mordechai, bow down to me. Said Mordechai, that I'll never do. I bow only to Hashem, Hashem Elohim, and I'm proud, so proud to be a Jew. <laughs> That's, that's what the Ralph Rebbe writes here. And the tremendous thing, we just read it, you know, like nothing. This is a tremendously powerful statement. 
that every single person, little kids, old people, rounded up, sent to the gas chambers, and, and still they say Shema Yisrael. They don't, it, it's amazing. And this is, when you tear apart, you tear away everything, that's what's left. That's what's left. That's the essence. And that's why we see by great rabbis like the Rebbe, such tremendous love of everybody. Because when he looks at somebody, he doesn't see, oh, this guy's got $5 million in the bank, or this guy is a big scholar, or this guy <clears throat> has this, or this guy has that. He sees that this guy is a person who's so devoted in his essence to God, he would even give his life up. How could I not love him? You understand? And that's why the great leaders of our people, like the Rebbe, because these are not just words on the page that the author ever wrote. This is how a tzaddik really thinks and feels with his whole being. Okay, page 105 at the bottom. We have to move on. We've been on this one line, on these words for three classes. I can't get past them. So this is why our sages said, that if one person all alone sits and learns Torah with all his heart, then the, the Almighty God dwells upon him. The Shekhinah, the presence of God dwells upon him. Turn the page, 106. And wherever you have 10 Jews together, even if they're playing pinochle, the presence of God is present. And even the highest ranking angel cannot stand in their presence because of the tremendous revelation of godliness. <clears throat> Monit is here. Okay, I'm gonna call this class a little bit short. Now we're gonna stop here. It's a good place to stop on page 106 because today is the yard site of your teacher's mother. So this class is in her honor, Sarah, Bas, Rev Moshe, all of us shalom. And so I'd like to give out charity, tzedakah for everybody. To give charity, where is it? Here we go. Who's, where's this, here's a pushka. Okay. Gila, you're gonna be the monitor. You'll take the pushka around to everybody. And Chama, you give out these coins. Two, three, one, two, three, five. Everyone gets three. Everybody gets one. One, okay. One, two, three. You get for this table. Did I put it on third one? Three. One, two. One, two. Everybody, please. Whoops. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Remember, <coughs> Gila, on the way to class tomorrow, look up. Things will be looking up. Take that around. You're the monitor. Take it around. Oh, okay. you have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>